Hello and welcome to the Artful Efforts YouTube channel. I'm Kat Murphy, your hostess today, and I am going to be interviewing Rachel Lopez Bagan. She is an awesome branding expert, graphic designer, the woman behind Playground Design. She's going to be giving us all the info on how to make a visual brand identity for ourselves as artists, how to make sure that complements the aesthetic of our work why it's so hard to brand ourselves, and why sometimes it's really important to step away from our work and gain some perspective on it. So before we get into that, make sure you subscribe below, hit that subscribe button, and in the description of this video, I also have our newsletter sign up link. So sign up for the newsletter, you'll get blogs and videos and opportunities to be featured on the blog or in a video and pretty soon you're going to get some exciting event information there as well so make sure you subscribe below subscribe on youtube let's get into the interview i don't know for sure if the love i feel for her is real or just a fantasy Rachel, thank you so much for joining me today. Would you mind telling us just a little bit about your business and yourself and how you got into design? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Rachel Bagan. I'm the owner and creator of Playground Design. Uh, and yeah, basically I got started. I actually have a bachelor's degree in architecture and that was kind of the career path I got started in. And while I was doing that, I was doing a lot of graphic design and branding design on the side and kind of feeling out if that was something I felt a bit more passionate about versus the architecture. And after working for a couple of years in the architecture world while kind of juggling architecture and graphic design, I slowly realized, okay, graphics is really where my heart lies. Um, and so about two to three years ago, I always confuse the dates, I decided to take the leap to start what is Playground. And basically what this company is, is um, it's my own company and I use it to do, like I said, branding design, logo design, website design, um, book design, really anything that encompasses visual identity. Um, that's what I really get inspired to, to work on with people. My bread and butter are small starter businesses just because I love working with people who are starting on a passion project or just getting their go in the business that they're pursuing because I have like a kinship with them since that was my experience and yeah that's kind of kind of the background of how it all got started and, and a little bit of what I do. Well that's awesome because I'm good with the writing and the copy stuff but I need help with my visual stuff so I'm sure <laughs> I'm gonna learn a lot in this interview too. I got you, yes. <laughs> um, okay cool so my first question because I also do marketing, um, marketing stuff, again, more focused on like the copy and the, you know, automation, mm -hmm. whatnot. Um, so I'm curious, because I hear a lot of different definitions of branding, what your definition of branding is. Totally. Um, so again, since I do fall on the graphic design end, I tend to skew more towards the visual representation. So a really simple breakdown of what I'll usually tell my clients is branding is going to be obviously your logo design, your color scheme behind your brand. So like, for example, if you look at a brand like Nike, they've got a very clear, distinct brand color that goes with them. It's very neutral. It's usually black and white with maybe some neon accents, but it's very clear when you see those colors that you're looking at Nike. Um, so again, yeah, your color story fonts that you're associating with your brand. Um, and then in today's, age with social media and the importance of that. It, it also encompasses kind of what your social media stylization is. So pretty much anything visually that's connecting to your brand. So that if I saw it and I didn't know that it was coming from you, I would connect that visual of like, oh, that's from this brand because that's what, that's their style. It totally makes sense. I do dip a little bit into, like you said, the marketing end because it is, it's a little bit of both, right? Like you can have gorgeous branding without a clear mission statement or elevator pitch of who you are and it's not going to work same as you can have an amazing well thought out mission statement and bio and, and understanding of what your brand is without having any kind of a visual connection to it so you kind of need one one needs to go with the other so it is a little bit um, a little bit of both and really just your identity who you are who you're trying to appeal to what your brand is in a very clear and concise way that's going to be 
easy for someone off the street to grasp in a couple sentences or again in like a quick visual or a business card or a quick view at your website. I love that idea. It's like I can relate to it, especially with social media. It's like I have certain artist friends that I might see a post and be like, oh, that's so this person and send yeah. it to them. And so I'm thinking like those people that I kind of have that idea of probably have more strong branding totally for, for their work. Yeah. It's interesting. Like, cause I'll do, I do a little bit of social media work and, um, and a little bit of creative art direction. Um, and that's something like that people, once they start talking to them about, like they start noticing like in their fellow designers or other brand owners, like, Oh my God, you're right. Like they have, even if it's just a photo that has no ounce of branding or graphic on it, but that photo is following the style and the vibe of everything else that they're putting out. Like if you have, we did some work for um, this company rabbit air. And so all their images are going to look really clean and bright and crisp and like families and, you know, a little bit more in the corporate end where it's like, you see what they're putting out. And even if there's not the little rabbit air logo or anything, you know that it's coming from them because they've made it so clear. Like, this is who we are. This is our visual little billboard of our company. Right. Totally. Um, so I was going to ask you some things just about your clients more specifically, and then getting into kind of like how artists can use some of these um, ideas that you're and concepts that you're talking about. So what are the top challenges for your clients that you deal with that can also apply to artists, but you can talk more from the client perspective? Um, I know you're talking about kind of the seamless, cohesive look. I'm sure that's kind of the overall, but if you want to get nitty gritty with like what it is that you talk about them with and help them with. Totally. Um, so it's funny because this is a problem that I myself experienced when I was trying to brand playground, which I always tell my clients, like, listen, I struggled with it too. It's really hard. Um, really the main thing is getting clients to hone in on who they are. Um, and if you look at it, like, I guess from the visual end, getting them to understand that you may like a lot of different styles, like I'll have people send me inspiration imagery because it gives me a better connection of like what they're responding to visually when I'm designing something for them. And the main problem that I'll run into is people will have a lot of different styles just because they'll like, they'll find pieces of work or logos that they think are really pretty, but it doesn't really connect to their brand or it's telling like completely different stories. And so that's the biggest challenge that I kind of walk through with a lot of my clients is like, okay, let's pull back and let's really sit down and write down. And I actually have a form that I'll send clients for this of who exactly are you trying to target? Who is your, dem your target demographic and keep it as specific as you can. And then sometimes I will come in and if I have suggestions on, okay, I think this market applies to you, but here's a here's another market that I don't think you're realizing you can actually have an appeal to if we spin it this way. Um, so it really, it, that's the main one is really getting, getting clients to get a very clear understanding of what their brand is and what they're trying to achieve also. So a lot of people will come to me and the most work that I do is like logo design. Um, and so a lot of people will come and just say, okay, I, I just want a logo, but they don't really know what they want to do with that logo, what that logo is going to be worth to them. Um, what they want it to achieve for them rather than, oh, I just want a watermark to put on my pictures. And this even applies to artists. It's understanding, yes, you want something to be able to kind of tag your work, but you want something that is going to very clearly represent who you are and the work that you're doing so that when potential clients or potential buyers or patrons see it, they're going to be inspired to want to see more from you. Um, so I'd say that's, that's the main challenge is getting like a clear understanding, like a clear message about what the brand is and what they're trying to achieve or same with the artist. And it's funny, I actually uh, made myself fill out the branding form that I sent to clients because I could not, it's really hard to design for yourself. And I'm sure artists can relate. Like I have photographer friends, like they cannot do photography like it's really hard if it's not for a client it's hard to like get in the mindset of like oh I am the client for myself um so doing that brand form like I even realized wow I really needed to sit down and spend some time to understand like who am I and what am I trying to say with this design and with this brand um and am I being successful in that or am I just picking something that looks pretty but isn't actually clearly representing like playground as a whole right and it's funny you kind of touched on my next question which is like that challenge in doing it for yourself versus other people. But I just had this thought while you were talking about that. Um, 
So I, I think I mentioned to you that I did this blog with Napoleon Gladney, who does arts marketing. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a similar issue here where it's like, um, one thing that I see with artists a lot is they, they tend to seem like they're speaking to other artists with the yes. way that they represent their work. And that's not, especially if we're trying to make a living off of our work, we don't want to rely on other artists because other artists are, let's be real, just as broke as we are and trying to do their yeah. own thing <laughs> and make their own stuff happen. Totally. Um, so I think that's really interesting about finding out like, okay, there's certain things that appeal to me as an artist, but my brand is about appealing to a certain audience. And when you mentioned the like, oh, you, I think this company can also appeal to this audience. How do you, you don't need to tell me everything that's on your form, but I'm curious mm -hmm. how you kind of find out what the audience is and who they're speaking to. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's kind of a combination of a couple of things. So it's the form. And then I'll also do like phone calls just to talk through and have people tell me like, what is your business? What are you trying to do? How did you start just to get a feel? And I'll use like one example. I had a client that I recently did some work for and um, it's a, a sister duo and they're doing like hand embroidered goods and crocheted goods and things like that. And they kind of set their market to tap into as upwards of forties, um, you know, middle-class to wealthy patrons. And after kind of talking to them and getting to see some of their products, I realized like, okay, actually there's a younger market to tap into here because this, the crochet and the hand embroidery, if you photograph it right, if you present it right, that's making a huge comeback in kind of the kitsch high fashion world that we're seeing a resurgence in now. Um, you know, and so it, it is, it's a little bit of like, it's helpful when I can get a taste directly from what they're doing and see what they produce if they have it, or just like learn about their process or learn about maybe some sketches, they have some prototypes. And this is obviously for a client that's doing products. Mm -hmm. um, and then I look at their form and I start reading, okay, this is who they think they can appeal to. I'll do some research myself within the field that they're falling under to make sure that I'm touching on kind of the fads within that field to make sure, okay, this is what we want to play to, but how can we separate ourselves? Um, and that's a big piece of it is really trying to find a way that I can like maximize their success rate. Cause that's part of it too. Like I don't, I don't ever want to come on and just be like, here's your logo. Good luck. You know, like I want to try and like really strategize with them and find ways. Like I've got a couple clients where like, I'll just like the same client was like, Oh my God, you guys should be doing hand embroidered face masks. Cause I'm seeing a ton of those and they're needed right now. And you guys do beautiful embroidery works. So, like I'll just shoot some over to past clients of like, I was just thinking about this. And like, again, ways where it's like, Sometimes if people can't, you know, afford to take on, like to, to pay me for creative art directs or anything like that, like I'll try and maybe just send like, here's some sample pictures. If you can recreate this style for your products, it's going to hit this demographic that I think you guys are missing um, just based on the research that I've done and based on how we've spoken and the products that have been coming out and kind of the style we've set for your branding. So yeah, it's, I guess it's a combination of like just the form and also just getting to know the person and getting into the products and really getting to know the field that they're, that they're in. Right. Yeah. And circling back to that question, why is it so hard for us to brand ourselves? I mean, I kind of think about it as almost like the best analogy I can come up with is like a dating profile. For some reason, it's way easier to make a dating profile for your friend yeah. than for yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. To me, I wonder if it's just because we have such a rich experience of our own life that it's hard to like narrow it down to yeah. that representation. But I'm curious what your thoughts are. Of why is that hard? And then how for yourself, were you able to kind of overcome that and create a brand for your own business? I think it's, I love that you compare it to the dating sites because that is exactly how it feels. Um, and I feel like at least for myself, like, so from a graphic design standpoint, it's really hard because I feel like this is going to sound really messed up, but like when it's just me that I need to like take care of, or like, I guess this could even fall into like the self-care category. Like I'm always really good at like making sure my friends are taking care of themselves when it comes to me, like, but I don't need to sleep or eat. Like that's just for you guys. <laughs> it weirdly slips in with like the branding too of like, I can, I can tell someone 
right off the bat, like, here's what your branding should look like. Here's what your website should look like. And yeah, when it comes to me, what I'll get hung up on is there's a lot of different styles I really like. And I guess maybe that's it is when I'm working for clients, I get a very clear brief of what they like. And I do get it. Like I'm usually working on multiple jobs at once. So I'm getting to hop between different styles at once. But when it's for me, it's really hard to figure out a design that's going to appeal to everyone, but is still telling the story of my specific design. But again, that needs to be wider because I don't want to rule out people who may want, like I, I consider my design really minimal, um, really clean. And I do get clients that want more ornate feminine designs. And so I always have to think like, oh, I can't do like, I can't go all the way into like what I want to do because that's going to alienate people. And so, and there is something weird about when it's, it's for me, it almost feels, and this is not true, but like, it always feels like this is a made up project. Like there's, I'm not being paid for this. No one's going to be upset if I don't do it. So I'll tend to just like, let it fall to the wayside. Um, and it's something I've been working on really hard to like get out of that mindset and understand like one, it is bringing in money because it's making, it's going to help finalize my brand when I need to pull in clients and two, like, this is my chance to do what I want without having to answer to someone, um, which like I said, is good and bad. Cause it's, it gives me a lot of freedom at sometimes like, Oh God, that's too much freedom. Like I want someone give me some constraints. Um, but I'll, you know, I'll flip between a million different constraints for one day of like, Oh, it's going to be like this really cool, like glitchy streetwear graphic. And then the next day, because I'll have seen something on, a fellow designer that I follow or something like, nope, I want it to be really minimal and corporate. Like, so it's hard to keep me focused. And I almost feel like when you hire someone else to do it, you give them what you want and then you just have to step back and let them do it. Um, and I've noticed it because like, again, I, I do a little bit of photography, but I do like to work with photographers for that same reason. It's like, I know that I'm really good at branding and I know that it's, I need, it's easier if I can have someone help me to take on some of the roles who their sole job is just photography. They've got a brief, they just go with it. And I just tell them what I want. And then I can step back um, and not feel like I need to run the whole show with it. So it's, I'm still figuring it out. Like, like I said, I'm still kind of, even with my website, keeping it updated and keeping myself from changing the design every couple of days, which I really want to do. But luckily I have the, the, logic to realize, okay, it's never going to be live if you're constantly changing it. And again, like you said, like I'll think, oh, it needs to appeal to other graphic designers. And it's like, but it doesn't, it needs to appeal to your clients. Um, and that's, that's a helpful reminder that I always have to tell myself, like, just step away from it. Like it's good. It's clear. Let it be. Right. Totally. Yeah. I see that with, um, um, cause my background's largely in performing art. So I see that a lot with, per with performers, even in their work sometimes, to be honest, like there's some work. So my background's largely in dance. Mm -hmm. There's some work that it's like, you have to really know dance to appreciate this work, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I think that's interesting, but definitely in branding, it's, it's hard to realize who, who our audience is sometimes, especially if, you know, talking from the dance perspective, it's like, if I do ballet, it's pretty clear who my audience is. Like my audience are people who like to go to the ballet and wear their right. fur or whatever. Um, but for those like smaller contemporary modern choreographers, it can be harder because also our audiences are more niche, I think. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone even knows the difference between modern and contemporary, I know very well. So yeah. figuring out like who that audience is, it can be hard to kind of hone in on it. Um, totally. Yeah. Okay. So how would you say for artists, if you were to approach an individual artist branding, how might that differ from branding a business? Like what are the different things that artists need to keep in mind that may, that maybe businesses don't so much? Yeah, I think, I think with artists, it's actually, it's good to go a little bit more personal and to go a little bit more into your style. Whereas for a larger business, your goal is to keep it approachable to as many people as you can. Again, I always use this reference because it's a huge brand and everyone knows like Nike, really simple swoop. Their branding has changed over the years, but they've had that simplicity and that minimalism where 
it's really easy to duplicate it and pop it onto a lot of merchandise and it's going to bring in a lot of money that works for a large scale brand or even a small scale brand that's just getting started. Whereas for an artist, like let's say like a dancer or a painter or a photographer, because it is such a, it's such a personal small like piece of yourself. Like you are selling your creative work. You're not trying to appeal to everyone. You have your set style and that's why people are coming to you. I always feel, cause I'll do it even for like people who are starting blogs where it's okay to let it be, a little bit more detailed to let it be a little bit more emotional rather than I don't want to say clear because it should still be clear but like rather than that being the main driver I think it's good to let pieces of yourself slide in so usually when I'll work with people who are doing that or even friends of mine who are trying to figure out like a simple watermark or something to kind of give them an identifier I'll always tell them like you know I'll send over my form just to help and it's like but really think about this from an artist standpoint of if I'm buying your art, like, and this is like, again, like a painter, a sculptor, or anything like that, I feel like in that world, people want to know who you are and they want to know, like, why is this worth having? What's like, this sounds so like corny, but like, who's the soul behind this piece, you know? Um, and I think that is kind of an interesting dichotomy because you want that personal, but again, you still want it where it's not too much where you can't actually like it's going to take away from your art so it's kind of like you have to play with the two of like it wants to be personal but it also wants to complement your artwork so a really literal example if you have someone that works like in a lot of colors or you know really bright loud stuff you probably want a brand that's going to be maybe black and white and maybe you let the form work be the bright loud but the colors aren't going to pull where they kind of play off each other if that makes sense yeah, that's really interesting. That's a really good thing to think about is like how your branding <clears throat> complements your work rather than necessarily reflects the work. Yeah, it's a hard line to walk too. Like, again, I know this from my own experience. And <laughs> it's a really fine line and it takes a lot of fine tuning. And like, even if you can't work with a brand, I always suggest like have some trusted friends. Um, possibly in your field or, or again, maybe you have some friends that hit within that target demographic of who you think your artwork is appealing to and treat it like if you're working on it yourself, like treat it as if you're working with a client, do some rounds and then do a pitch to your friends and get their input. Cause that is going to pull you out of, out of it enough to understand, like, cause it is, it's really easy to get caught up in it when you're the only eyes that are on it and you start thinking like, oh, this represents this and this represents that. And people are like, yeah, I didn't get any of that. It just looks really busy or it's distracting me from your work. Um, so it's always helpful to have like some feedback people who are, make sure they're people you actually want to appeal to too. And I say that like, don't get like 15 people because the more people you have, the more conflicting ideas, but just like two or three and just kind of run through it with them. It's, it actually is really helpful. So you can kind of have your insight and you can also have someone on the outside to kind of pull you back when they need to. I love what you were saying too about um, the personalization because just now I was thinking like when you buy from a business, a product or service, you're buying something to help yourself. So like mm -hmm. you're the main character in that story. Mm -hmm. But when we buy artwork, you're buying the artist's name in a lot of yeah. ways. Like, the knowing who the artist is and what they represent and where their place is in the art world is why some pieces are multi-millions of dollars it's literally the name on the work so i love what you're saying about especially with the age of social media that we're in people want to know what's behind the work and they'll connect to what's behind the work and that's what's going to make them buy into the work itself in a lot of ways hundred percent. That's like, I really, that's a really beautiful way of putting it too. And it is, it's true. Like they're buying a piece of you. So you want to make sure that that's coming through. I love that. Um, so I, I kind of know the answer to this one, but maybe it's just to kind of help um, spark the conversation. But how I have it written is, does branding develop over time or do you recommend an artist have it all figured out before they even try starting to put out themselves as a brand? So it would be amazing if you could just have everything figured out and it was never going to change, um, especially in the art world. My experience is like, that's impossible because 
you're going to, you're going to change. So your artwork is going to change because it is so connected, like whether it's dancing, painting, photography, like it's going to update and morph as you go. Um, so my thing is when you are working on branding to do your best to create something that's going to, that's not going to be like too trendy, something that will last and age with you. Um, and like that goes back to like that fine line if you want it to represent your work without being too over the top, because if it's too representative of just the work you're doing right now, you're gonna have to change it every couple of years. Um, so almost creating something that can grow with you again, like I'm just going to keep using them because it's like the most my my easy reference, but Nike, they, they grew and it did change. If you look at their logo, it changed over the years but it was kind of effortless and you don't really realize it's changing because it's all still connected in that underlying language. Um, I mean, again, it's a great example because obviously you go from the seventies to the nineties, you're going to have to change because what appealed to people in the seventies does not appeal in the nineties because our, our graphics and our cultural norms have shifted so much. So I almost feel like you have to think about it that same way, the same way, like, painting styles shift, dancing styles shift, new styles come out. You might want to explore something different. You might go through something that's different, that's going to impact your work in a different way. So creating something that's you, but can grow with you. So not trying so much to focus on something that's static, but just like, it's almost like you're establishing a foundation that you're going to keep building on. If that makes sense. That totally makes sense. Um, and I think to, to bring it back, I think that's why it makes a lot of sense as artists for us to take that personal route that you were talking about, because if we're taking something really personal to our core, mm -hmm. that's not going to change over time, right? Mm -hmm. So even if we're shifting the look and feel or whatever, if the core of the branding is really true to who we are as artists, even mm -hmm. as our work evolves, it's still going to be relevant to who we are as an artist. So I love, 100%. yeah, I love how that ties in. Um, okay. How can artists running their own website, social media and creating quality check themselves when they're putting content and messages out? Because I know for myself, I mean, I have the blog and I also have my own art pra practice and I also have, you know, I'm helping people with mark like clients with marketing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, for me, it's like, for me, it's just spelling errors is the most obvious, like, yeah. quality check. But even just generally, it can be hard when we're trying to create all this content, work on our, our stuff. Like, how do we make sure that it is aligned with our brand when we put it out with all this other stuff? Do you have any hacks, basically? Ooh, yeah, that's, that's a hard one. Um, <laughs> I mean, the main one, which is like a super simple, what I've started doing with myself is I will literally, I have to set aside a, like a day, once a week, a day where I'm just going to sit down and plan out my Instagram feed and plan out like, okay, I need to do a, and I, this is tentatively because I still need to start it, but like getting into writing blogs, like, okay, this week I'm going to try and do two posts this week and it's going to be on why branding is important and like the difference between HTML and flash or something like that. Um, but scheduling, like for me, I do a lot better if I have a clear schedule and it's not kind of floating around in my head or sticky notes all over my desk. Um, so what I've started doing is just having a very clear schedule and I will block out time and I will tell people and clients like I'm not available at this time. Like that's my time to work on my stuff. And I'm really fortunate that I have a lot of friends and community around me that like, like copywriters and photographers and people who can, I can run my stuff by to make sure, because like you said, like spelling errors, I mean, that is the death of me. It is one of the things I struggled the most with. Um, and I literally have some friends where I'll just ask like, Hey, do you have any time? Can you just run through this? Like I've checked it, but my eyes have been on it so long. I'm sure I may have missed something. And I mean, the other, like, I don't know if it's a hacker, but just like a obvious thing that took me a while to grasp is like, once you've worked on something, you don't need to put it out right away. Like put it down for an hour, step away from it and come back. Um, because at least for me, what I like to do is I'll just sit and I'll get in a, like, I'll get on a roll where it's like, I can't stop because I'm in the mode and like, I'm inspired. And while it seems like a good idea, it never is. Cause that's when the most mistakes happen. Cause I'm staring at the same thing for hours on end. Um, and actually my husband, cause he's 
he works next to me because he's also self-employed and he'll catch me. He's like, okay, you haven't taken a break in like eight hours. You need to get, get away from the computer. Um, but usually when I do, I'll sit down and it's so much easier. Like what would have taken me an hour to like get my head around it takes me like 15 minutes because I just needed a break to refresh and just look at it with fresh eyes. So really those would be my, my two main things. And then just like basic tech stuff to use. If you're trying to keep your Instagram on track, find a planning software so that you can plan your posts. I like to do it where I'll plan my posts for the month. Um, on one day so that I can sit down. I, that way I know it's consistent because I'm writing all the captions at the same time. I'm laying the photos out at the same time. And then I don't need to worry about thinking of that every time I want to post. I can just worry up, about interacting with people on my page and looking at other people's work and doing stuff like that. So that's super helpful for me as, as automated as you can get it so that you can kind of get your stuff done in, in an, one chunk rather than trying to like write a blog post and then you, oh, you got to do an Instagram post and you need to post to Twitter. And now you got to do Facebook. Like it quickly gets really jumbled and really chaotic. So much time social media. Yes. Cause then like you said, then when do you interact with people? If you yeah. like posting every single day, yeah, um, and you can get burnt out. Like I get like that before I started doing planning is like, I would, I would be hitting it really hard and then I would get so burnt out on it and I would get caught up in comparing myself to other people and rather than using it as like, oh, this is really inspiring and like we can support each other. It was just because I was so exhausted of trying to figure out the right thing to write. And, you know, it got to be where I would just stop using it for months on end, which can happen and it's not good for your business either. So yeah, the, the easier you can make it on yourself so that you don't get burnt out, you don't fall into that trap of comparing rather than just using it as like, it's inspiration or like, this is a great way for me to speak to my clients or speak to my audience rather than a way to kind of beat yourself up. Um, and yeah, for me, it's that it was just planning it out and not trying to do it constantly and keep track of it at all times of the day. And do you use like Buffer or Hootsuite or what do you use? I like using Planoly. It's kind of my preferred. I did use later for a while, but I for I think I like Planoly because it's easier for me to just drag and do the visuals of it. I'll actually... When I work with my clients, um, what I'll actually do is I'll do a full layout in uh, Adobe InDesign <laughs> um, because it's just, I love using Adobe. So I'll do that and send approvals and then I'll go into Planoly and just do my um, planned posting for the month. I mean, if you have more, if you can do two months in advance, like do it and then know like if you need to change things, you can always change things, but it's just a way to take like a huge load off your chest. I've never even heard of Planoly, so I'll have to check it out a good one um and you just keep like reading my mind so my next question was are there any automated processes or easy ways to ensure that we're consistent so i think you already yeah. you already answered that one <laughs> wait i'm on top of it <laughs> yes you are um okay cool i'm getting down to my last couple here so um any just additional branding tips for artists that you can think of that you're like i really need artists to know this yeah, I mean, the big one, and I think I've kind of touched on it a little, is like, keep it simple, um, keep it legible. Um, that's the big one, keep it legible. A lot of times artists, and like I said, because you're walking that line of like, it needs to be a piece of view, but it needs to also appeal is they'll get really, they'll have a lot of really fine details um, or a lot of colors. And the downside of that is when you shrink it down, you're not going to see any of those details. It's going to look like a blob. Um, and the more colors you use, the less places you can stick that logo. So if you do a partnership with a dance company, or if you're displaying at a gallery, they may not want to put your rainbow, like your rainbow colored logo on their material because it conflicts with their brand identity. So if you can keep it down to one to two colors max, it's ideal um, because it, it helps with partnerships. It also helps with how many places you can apply that logo. So again, if you wanted to, and this might fall more on, on a business's end, but if you wanted to create any kind of merch, the more simple it is, the wider, um, the wider the possibilities are because there's also restrictions when you start using colors and patterns as to how you can translate that logo. Like if you wanted to do a laser etching or a sticker version, um, or a foil stamping or anything like that. The simpler, the better. 
uh, would be my main thing and keep it simple. Like most artists typically it's just their name or a signature or like initials. Those are awesome. You don't need to have your full mission statement as a part of your logo that just gets distracting. And again, it makes a giant, like a paragraph as your logo, which nobody's going to read it. It's, it's not important. Um, just as simple, as clear, as identifiable as you can make it, the better. I like what you're saying too with that, because um, <clears throat> especially what you're just saying about having your mission statement as a paragraph, it's like, as an artist, you want your work to speak for itself. It's kind of totally. like explaining a joke. Like no joke exactly. is good if you have to explain it. So if your branding is like explaining your work, it means your work isn't doing what it needs to do and it's supposed to do. Exactly. Or like it ends up undoing what your work's doing because maybe someone was getting their own read and now you've contradicted it or yeah, it is. It's exactly like explaining a joke where it's like if you had to explain it, it probably wasn't that funny. Um, <laughs> You know, so yeah, that's that's a really good way of putting it. And what you just said too, I love, um, <clears throat> where it's like, if you're too detailed in your branding as an artist, you're almost trying to control the audience perspective too much. Yep. And yep. I love that kind of Nietzsche an idea of like, once you put it out there, it has a life of its own and you don't get to control it anymore. So yeah. I think like a hard mindset thing is like letting it go and not feeling like, no, you're not getting the right thing out of my, my film totally. or whatever. <laughs> it's hard. Like it's, I do, I have a publication that I was working on for a while that's on pause because of COVID, but I ran into that where it's like being able to let people have their experience and their relationship with it separate of mine. Like it was hard. I'm like, yeah, you're not, that's not what it's supposed to say. Or like, you didn't get that graphic and it's like, no, they did. And that's the beauty of it. It's like you said, like once you put it out there, it's, that's the appeal, right? Is like, it almost becomes a joining of like two souls. It's like the artist and it's the observer or the patron or the person who's enjoying it and like getting something from it that, I don't know, me is like when I do my graphic art, like I may not have even thought of, but it's really cool to see how it's affecting or someone else's influence on the art is, you know? Yeah, I love, um, I occasionally get invited and I love when I do to like artist feedback sessions of in process works. Mm -hmm. And I love when they get some feedback when the person's like, I really saw this and that. And the artist was like, I had, I had no idea that that was right. bad or whatever. Like, that's great though. Cool. It's kind of like fun and surprising and like letting, letting people have that journey can also affect us really positively as artists. So yeah, it's really, it's like part of the beauty of it. Yeah. Um, any words of encouragement for readers when it comes to branding, if they're feeling overwhelmed or maybe not knowing where to start? Yeah. Um, I mean, the big one is again, like I'm a professional brander and that's how I feel trying to brand myself. So like, you're not alone. That is a normal response to have. Um, and like I said, like if you can just take it small bites at a time. So it could be like, I'm just going to work on my brand name for this week. That's it. That's all I have to worry about. Don't think about the graphics. Don't think about your website. Like just hone in on like really small tasks. It makes it a lot easier. And also understanding like you're going to be your harshest critic, which is why I say have some other people because it will pull you out of the negative self-talk that might come up. Um, and just understand that like there is no perfect right. Like you have to get it hundred percent right now. You just do your best. And you know, if you can research other research other artists who are doing work that you really like that seem to be attracting the people you want to attract, stay open. Um, and yeah, like I said, like, just, I guess even just life advice, like be gentle on yourself, be easy on yourself, take it bit by bit. Um, and uh, yeah, that, I guess that would be it. Like, don't be afraid to ask for help. Like if you see artists or designers whose work you really like, if you can like contact them and ask them a question, you know, I've had people reach out to me and like, I love that. Cause it's just cool to one, find out people like my work and two, to kind of like give some feedback um, and help like a fellow artist out, you know? So if you, you can lean into that too, of like, you don't have to know it all right now, you can reach out and ask for help. Like literally the worst that could happen is they'll say no, which really isn't that bad. Right. And I love your, I just want to bring back into your, just step away when you need to. And it's like, I don't know if it's true for you. Like for me too, what'll happen is when things are going really bad, like when I'm working, like I was working on a gallery exhibition for that publication that I do. 
And again, like I hated everything I had designed. I've been working on it for like a month and it was just not getting any better. I could not, I couldn't, but I had that mind of like, I can't take a break now because I'm so behind and I'm not making any progress. And usually when you have that feeling is when you need to take the break the most. Cause same thing, like I stepped away, I went and got coffee. I let it go for a couple of days. And yeah, I came back and I was way more productive. I loved what I was producing. And, and it was as simple as like, I always call it like your inner critical voice. It's like ignoring that voice and understanding like, it's not the end of the world. If I take a break, it will get finished and it will help me. Like you are actually helping yourself and contributing to your productivity by stepping away from it rather than trying to like force a square peg into a round hole. That's just, it's just going to get worse. I think that's so important because we get so like, I have to be productive all the time. I'm totally that way. But Same. also I think sometimes when I step away and come back, I all of a sudden like what I had done when I was yeah. hating it, when I was in it. And then I step away and come back and then reread it. And I'm like, oh, actually this is good. I don't know why I was freaking out about it in the first place. Yeah, <laughs> just like that perspective. Again, like I feel like artists too, like we're so harsh on ourselves. So when you like, if you're already not feeling good, like that's when like the critical stuff comes out and you're right. Like you could step away and realize, actually that was great work. I was just hungry or tired or overwhelmed. And, and again, like stuck in this idea that I have to be busy all the time when like, you really don't, you're doing yourself a disservice. And I say that, like, I need to listen to that. Cause I too fall into like, I gotta be busy all the time. And I have to have a million clients and how dare you think I can take a break to eat dinner? Like I can't do that. And it's like, but you can, you can. Oh, and that was so brilliant. What you just said to, to me, um, where it's like, sorry, I just have so many thoughts now, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, we like, if we are in a negative mental state of, and our work, it, we kind of see our work as an extension of ourselves. Of yes. course, we're going to think negatively about our work when we're in a negative mental state to begin with. So taking that time to like, get just into a different headspace might mean, I mean, even as a consumer of art, I might see a movie one day and hate it. Right. And see it again a year later and be like, oh my God, that was so good. Why did I hate that? Totally. And the work hasn't changed. It's my mental state that's changed. That's it's so cool. cool. Well, and there's like, there's this saying that I always really like, um, you probably know because it's pretty common, but like halt. So if you're feeling like angry and things aren't working like halt and it's like, okay, am I hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? If any of those apply, deal with it, eat, sleep, go see a friend. Um, I don't know, watch something that's not gonna, that's gonna help subside your anger, like go work out, go hit something, whatever you gotta do. Um, Cause you're right, like your mental state matters and it almost like puts a filter on everything that you're seeing. That's brilliant, I love that. Um, I know you shared a bunch of links with me, so I'll definitely share those links in the video description and the blog and all that good stuff. Um, my last question is just how readers can connect with you, but I was also wondering, I know you said you have that form, is that just something you give to clients or do you have kind of like a link where people can give you their email and they can get that form to take it just on their own? The brand is typically something I'll send to clients. So once we've kind of signed on a contract, um, but what I am planning on doing and adding this to my site is having more of a general questionnaire just for people to do to help them figure out if they feel like they need to work with a brander or if that's enough for them to kind of go on their own. Um, so that's, it's in process. So it will be on the site soon. And it's just general questions. Like I said, like, who's your target demographic? Um, what are you trying to achieve with this brand? What's your elevator pitch? Uh, what's your name? Seems really simple, like your brand name, but like, it's helpful just to write it down. Cause sometimes you write it and realize like, Ooh, that doesn't, I don't like that. I need to rework that. Um, so I'm planning to get that up on the site, hopefully within the next month or so. Um, and that'll just be under a resources tab that'll have some blog posts similar to what we're discussing and just some ways to help people who maybe aren't ready to fully commit to working with a designer, but do have some questions or are just starting to look at that process. Beautiful. Well, whenever this comes out, um, we'll make sure as soon as that comes out to add it to the description in the blog as well. Awesome. And then I know I have your Instagram, it's play, grind, G-R-N-D, design, mm -hmm. with underscores between each word. And then where, is that the best place to, re to connect with you or is there other ways that you think people should? Connect? Instagram is great. Um, I'm 
I'm checking my DMs pretty often, but always, um, if you can, email is better. Um, and we've got two emails and I'll, e I'll email this to you. Um, but my personal is just Rachel at playspaceground.com and ground is spelled G-R-N-D. Um, and then I also have a general, which is just info at playspaceground.com. And that's the one that's listed on our website. So I always say like, email me because as you know, if it's a DM and we're not following each other, it may get hidden in my requests. Um, so email's best, but feel free to DM. And if I see it, I'll certainly respond right away. Um, yeah, I'd say those, those are the best, the best sources to kind of contact me sometimes Facebook, but yeah, email is really ideal. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. You gave me a ton of things to think about for myself. I'm like thinking while we're going through the interview, but uh, this has been great. Thank, thank you, you so much for, for having me. me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to publish it. Mm -hmm.